So today I want to talk to you about the glycolytic enzymes. Now the glycolytic enzymes, they follow a particular naming convention typically based off of the substrate in which they work on. And this will make a little bit more sense as we move through this presentation. And if you haven't seen my previous video on the glycolytic metabolites first, I recommend that you go back and watch that one because then this one will make a little bit more sense. So to start right off, the first thing that we have in glycolysis is glucose. And the first thing that we do with glucose is we add a phosphate group to the sixth position. And to do this, we have to take what's called a kinase. And a kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate group to a substrate. So in this case, it's glucokinase. Gluco, meaning glucose, and then kinase, adding a phosphate group to that glucose. Or we have hexokinase. And hexo meaning six or six carbons because glucose has six carbons in it. And then kinase again, meaning we're adding a phosphate group to the glucose, or in this case, a six carbon molecule. Now glucokinase though and hexokinase, they are different enzymes and they act separately in different tissues. Specifically, glucokinase acts in the liver and the beta cells of the pancreas, whereas hexokinase, it, it kind of acts everywhere else in the body. That's all you really need to know for this video, but I can go into more detail in a different video. So moving on, we have glucose 6-phosphate and we want to convert that into fructose 6-phosphate. So to do that, we have to take what's called an isomerase. An isomer of something has the same number of atoms, it's just that they're arranged differently. So in this case, fructose 6-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate are isomers of one another. So the enzyme that converts glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate is phosphoglucoisomerase. Phosphogluco isomerase. Phosphogluco meaning we have a phosphorylated glucose and we are converting glucose 6-phosphate into an isomer fructose 6-phosphate. I like to abbreviate this as phosphoglucoisomerase. Moving forward and now we want to add a phosphate group to the one position of fructose 6-phosphate. So to do that we have to take phosphofructokinase 1. So a phosphofructo, we have phosphorylated fructose, kinase, meaning that we are adding a phosphate group specifically to the 1 position. And from this we get fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So the next enzyme in this pathway doesn't really follow any convention unless you know the structure of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And this is an aldolase enzyme. And aldolase, it just means alcohol, and we just have some alcohol groups in fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And uh, aldolase, it converts fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And these are both three carbon compounds. So you'll notice though that the glucoses and the fructoses, they all have six carbons in them. Whereas moving forward from dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde three phosphate, these are all now three carbon molecules. So the next enzyme in the pathway though, it interconverts dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde three phosphate. And this is also an isomerase. This is going to be triose, meaning three carbons, phosphate, i.e. they have phosphate groups, isomerase, and these are also isomers of one another. And then the next enzyme in this pathway, um, it is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Now a dehydrogenase enzyme, it takes a hydrogen from a substrate and transfers that hydrogen to something else. So in this case, it's transferring a hydrogen from G3P to NAD. And making NADH. And typically, whenever you see a dehydrogenase enzyme, it'll be doing a reaction like this. And if you look at, say, the Krebs cycle, you'll notice that there are actually a couple of dehydrogenase reactions in the Krebs cycle, and they also produce NADH or FADH2. So remember now that this process is driven by glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. I should also start to mention that this is where the naming conventions really start to break down during glycolysis. Particularly, you'll notice that the conversion from G3P to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate does not utilize a kinase enzyme. 
And I'm just going to point out actually that this enzyme is also known as GAPDH. And I don't know if this is really beyond the scope of what you need to know, but GAPDH is basically what this enzyme is referred to mostly. And we actually use this a lot as a control in Western blotting. So this is just another name for it, and I think it's worth knowing. Simply because if you come across it in any kind of literature, that's what they're referring to. So for the next sequence of enzymes, I think it's worth it to actually look at them in reverse order, because the naming convention makes more sense in reverse order. So if we start at pyruvate and move backwards to PEP, or phosphoenyl pyruvate, PEP has a phosphate group on it. And this enzyme is pyruvate kinase. You'll notice though that the naming convention from left to right doesn't really make any sense. And the reason for that is that pyruvate and PEP were studied in vitro, and they found that when they were looking at pyruvate, pyruvate was becoming phosphorylated. So they named this enzyme pyruvate kinase. Unfortunately though, when you look at it in the body, in vivo, the reaction is catalyzed from left to right. But regardless, the naming convention stuck and we're stuck with pyruvate kinase. The same goes for PEP to 2 phosphoglycerate. This reaction is catalyzed by enolase, or you are taking an enol from phosphoenol pyruvate and converting it into 2 phosphoglycerate. So the next enzyme, though, moving from 2 phosphoglycerate to 3 phosphoglycerate, this reaction is driven by an enzyme known as phosphoglycerate mutase. Now mutases are enzymes that move functional groups specifically. Technically you could say like, oh, this is phosphoglycerate isomerase because technically they're isomers of one another, but since we're specifically only moving a phosphate group, it makes more sense to call it a mutase enzyme. And this enzyme actually works in both directions. So then our last reaction, moving from 3-phosphoglycerate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, is going to be driven by phosphoglycerate kinase. And remember, phosphoglycerate, here is our phosphoglycerate molecule, and we are adding a phosphate group to the 1 position, so kinase molecule. So this is a little bit messy, but let's move from left to right to review. We start with glucose and move to glucose 6-phosphate, which is going to be driven by glucokinase or hexokinase. Moving from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, we're going to have phosphoglucoisomerase. And then moving from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we use phosphofructokinase 1 because we are adding a phosphate group to the 1 position of a fructose 6-phosphate. And again, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to dihydroxyacetone phosphate and G3P is catalyzed by aldolase. And the interconversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is driven by triose phosphate isomerase because these are now three carbon molecules. So then moving from right to left, if we start at pyruvate, we have pyruvate kinase, which is essentially adding a phosphate group to pyruvate, thus creating PEP. But remember though, this reaction does not typically occur in vivo or in the body. It was just that this was found incidentally in vitro in a test tube. And then moving from right to left again, phosphoenyl pyruvate catalyzed by the enzyme enolase. And then 2-phosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate or vice versa is phosphoglycerate mutase because mutases specifically move functional groups. And then 3-phosphoglycerate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is catalyzed by phosphoglycerate kinase. And then of course, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. It produces an NADH, but we also add a phosphate group to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. But this reaction is driven by glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, or in other words, it's also known as GAPDH. So I'm gonna clean this up real fast, just erase all these strokes. So the last thing that I wanna mention is the irreversible steps in glycolysis. So the way that I have this compartmentalized makes this a little easier to remember. Specifically, each of the boxes that have two metabolites in them 
with the exception of dihydroxyacetone phosphate and G3P, are the irreversible steps in glycolysis. So, moving from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, this is an irreversible step, glucokinase, hexokinase. Moving from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, this is an irreversible step driven by PFK1. And then moving from PEP to pyruvate, this is also an irreversible step driven by pyruvate kinase.